Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, even on the best of days, family is, well, it's pretty darn complicated. And guess what? If you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this uh, podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of entertainment industry professionals. We pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more, in a light and in a conversational fashion. And, you know, if you like how we do things around here... I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you do, because let's face it, you're listening right now. And if you are listening, subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. Gives you a five-star rating. Gives you a big thumbs up on your podcast provider of choice. We're available pretty much everywhere. Places like Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In the Seats YouTube channel. And uh, if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we'd really appreciate it. Also... Don't hesitate to check us out on social media. We're on the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram, Letterboxd, the TikTok, and, well, probably a few other places. And maybe not even TikTok for that much longer. Who knows these days? But uh, we're at In the Seats for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In the Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large. Because guess what? If we love to watch it and write about it and talk about it, we love it even more when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please do us that kindness and pay us a visit. In theaters now, or well, tomorrow, as of, you know, the time of this recording, it's uh, we're, we're diving into Daniel's Gotta Die, which is a fun, fun little romp of a movie in, in sort of the vein of Ten Little Indians and Knives Out, but it's it's the story of, uh, of a dysfunctional family who, uh, uh, you know, rich family, who find their father, played by Iggy Pop, uh, just on the on the brink of passing away and his life is over. Uh, and he summons his, his favorite son, Daniel, played by Joel David Moore, to, uh, uh, to talk about sort of reuniting the family and getting everyone together, and everyone does get together. But uh, Dad had some caveats about handing out the inheritance once they all get together. And they decide to go through with it, but the siblings also decide to go through another another plan. Uh, because Daniel's in charge of everything. And Daniel, who's the, Daniel's the good one. The rest of them, not so much. But uh, they decide that Daniel's got to die. And it ends up being pretty hilarious. And it's got some fantastic comedic actors like Mary Lynn uh, Raskub, uh, Bob, the Jason Jones, and it's the last film of the late, great Bob Saget, like I said, Geek Pops in it, Joel David Moore's in it. It's a lot of fun. Is it? It is in theaters now, and advan- and in advance of uh, this movie coming out, we had the unique pleasure of sitting down and talking with the director of the film, a uh, friend of the show, Canada's own Jeremy Lalonde, and we asked about sort of the ve- the development of it all and how this was a story that uh, changed locations due to COVID and sort of came out of all of that, and it's. Uh, just the experiences then in. Jeremy's always a good interview, but uh, like I said, go check out Daniel's Gotta Die. It is in theaters probably as you're listening to this. If if not, it is on uh, in theaters on March 15th. But first, enjoy our talk with Jeremy, because between you and me, it's a darn good one. Dude, I always gotta do that first. But I mean, Jeremy, obviously, first off, just thanks again for coming back on the show, and uh, just congrats on the movie. As always, I appreciate your time. Oh, of course, Dave, anytime. Now, I mean... Walk me through the origins of this one, because I know this movie's been floating around for a bit. Yeah, so uh, we I was attached to this movie quite a while before it got shot. It was just one of those movies that took a while to put together because the casting is such a thing, right? right. You're casting a family, and it's also a family of, you know, comedians. Oh, not comedians. I mean, the, the characters themselves are comedic. So, you know, the original impetus for this movie was that it was written to shoot up north in northern Ontario, uh, and then COVID happened and everything kind of shut down and somehow our producers found a way to make it in the Cayman Islands because there was no <laughs> COVID there at the time. And of course, this was at the, the height of the pandemic when everything was shut down. We were all stuck with our families for the last eight months. And I got the call saying, hey, do you think you and the writer could rework the script to shoot in the Caymans and you go there for two or three months? And I was like, Yes. I, I we couldn't rewrite it fast enough. 
that would be because that are you gonna make be making every movie in the Caymans now? You're gonna, you're pretty, you're gonna get your producers to rework it so you can go down. Well, the, the the up the good thing about the shooting in the Caymans was that we were in the Caymans and we and it was like pre COVID times. The bad news is that COVID we were the first film ever to shoot entirely in the Cayman Islands. Oh damn! Okay, which is cool on paper, but in practicality, it means. They don't know how to make movies there. They're not used to movie shooting there. Oh my god! So, so they don't. Basically, that must have been a nightmare. Yeah, they don't have like you can't rent film equipment there if something breaks down. You know, they don't understand what it means to rent your house, especially a mansion. So there was all of those kind of things that we had to deal with, and and none of them were nightmarish, but it was just one of those learning curves of going, oh right, this is. Nobody here knows what we're doing and understands what we do. No, I mean, I guess that dovetails into the next question. I mean, obviously, other than the sort of being locked together in the Caymans for a few months, how did you manage to get this ensemble together, man? Because, I mean, you got a loaded cast on this one. Yeah, I mean, it, part of it, some of it's just the the standard. You send out love letters to actors and hope they respond. Um, Bob was friends with Leah and Nicholas, two of the producers. He'd worked with them before, so we were able to connect directly with Bob through them. Uh, some of the actors I knew because they're Canadian, like Jason Jones and Chantal O'Reilly and uh, Dax and Varun. Um, so those were people that we were able to connect with that way. Mary Lynn and, and um, Carly, I didn't know before. Uh, so those were just people that we you know, love their work, and so we were reached out to. And, the, and then Iggy was the weirdest one because, because we were shooting during the height of the pandemic. And when you got to the Caymans, you had to basically go to, you had to go to quarantine for two right. weeks. Right. So for that part in the movie, you know, the movie's about the family dealing with the aftermath of the father's death. So we wanted someone to play the father that had like some gravitas. Right. Yeah. That you look at it and you're like, holy shit. But the problem is, you know, when you're shooting under those circumstances, you know, who wants to like come in and do two weeks of quarantine, shoot for two or three days, and then go home and do another two weeks of quarantine? Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. It's a lot to ask of an actor. So we got lucky in that once we landed there, we realized that Iggy lived on the island. Brilliant. <laughs> and, and I'd seen him act in other things, you know, in small parts. And so we just said, can we like, We've got to be able to get to him. Like, let's find out if he's even interested. And, you know, I ended up having lunch with him the next day. And he was game because he was just hanging out and surfing. I love it. I absolutely love it. Now, I mean, I'm curious because obviously this is such a fun movie. And I mean, it's hilarious. But we've we've had movies like this before. But sometimes they get a little gaggy. Like mm -hmm. a little too sort of leaning into the joke a little too hard. This, I appreciated the fact that it was it was trying to still sort of give it stakes. Rather oh, than get overly comedic about them trying to kill him, they were actually trying to kill him. You know what I mean? Like, how important was it for you to sort of give it sort of a middle ground? Yeah, I mean, I think my issue and what drew me to this script was that I think when you have like these big, like dark family comedies is that they always end the same way. Right. Which everyone puts their differences aside and they come back together because at the end of the day, they're a family. Yeah. And I don't know if that's accurate to how real life is. I think sometimes your family just sucks and you have to do something about it. You know, so I like the idea that this wasn't, you know, spoiler alert. This wasn't necessarily going to end the way you expect it to with all the family kind of getting over their stuff. Like I wanted there to be real stakes to this situation, despite the fact that it's, you know, it's elevated. It's a bit over the top in some areas. I wanted you to actually spend the whole time wondering how the hell is this going to end? Well, I mean, we were absolutely, and I mean, but I've got to ask though, because I mean, you and I have known each other for a minute, and I mean, just the fact that you had these top shelf comedians all together in a room, and you're locked there for three months. How did you, as the director, manage to sort of toe the line and and keep work going? Because I can imagine there would be. I don't want to see what's. I don't want to see the hard drives of deleted deleted footage. I can imagine I'll be on the floor laughing, and there's a lot of it, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, when you're working, it's not my first rodeo when it comes to working with an ensemble cast. Right. And I think if nothing else, working my previous film, uh, How to Plan an Orgy in a Small Town, kind of really was a, a lesson in how to herd cats. <laughs> you know? Uh, and part of it is just, it's just kind of how I work on every project is that, 
you know, I always want to make sure we're getting the script because, you know, the, whether it's myself or another writer, you know, we, we put some effort into that thing. But I also know that it's like you don't hire someone like Jason Jones or Bob or any of these other talented comedians and don't give them like a shot to try to do something that is coming to them in the moment. Right. Yeah. Because so much comedy comes out of surprise. Right. And and you can go down bad paths with that in, in comedy. So I think like I'm a big fan of what I like to call structured improv. So it's it's you know, we don't just do whatever comes to our mind, but it's the idea of like if we can like plus one this joke by something that's in the moment, let's do it. Right. And I'll always give one for the actors to do whatever they want in a take. And then we might do another three takes based on that inspiration, you know, sure. especially, you know, once you're in a room and all of a sudden Jason Jones is covered in blood and he's holding a machete, you're like, we have to deal with this moment. Like this is this, like when you're looking at the page, you don't necessarily see all the things that are happening in the moment. So sometimes you just have fresh inspiration by realizing the realities of it when you're seeing it right in front of you, you know, so you lean into certain moments like that whether it's just like a reaction from a character that wasn't necessarily scripted and, and, and things like that. Now, I mean, I'm a little curious and I mean, I know this is a bit of a loaded question, but I got to ask it, but obviously, you know, you finish shooting and then shortly after we lost Bob and, and, and I'm kind of curious for you as a filmmaker, especially when you're putting something together kind of after the fact, like, is there an extra added weight, especially when you lose somebody who's like, obviously, who's as iconic as Bob? Or do you try not to sort of, do you just focus on the job at hand? Because I can imagine you can emotionally, you can get pulled multiple ways. Yeah, like by the time Bob passed away, but it, not quite a year after we shot. So, but I had finished editing the movie when he passed. We hadn't finished it completely. The, the sad part about when Bob passed away, I mean, besides all the other reasons why it's so heartbreaking, was that I just spoken to him two days earlier. He was in great spirits and he was so excited to watch the finished film because he didn't want to watch a rough cut. He didn't want to watch it without the finished music. And we weren't finishing it until the following week. So Bob never actually got to see the movie. Oh, no. Um, but So I didn't have that weight of going, oh, this is Bob's final performance. I got to like tweak it this and that which is i think was good because i didn't i i don't want to i think that would have been a disservice to it i think totally yeah no i think it's you, you just want to cut the best thing because of what it is not because you want it to somehow validate the final performance of someone i think that would be the wrong way to do it so i think it you know i don't want to say it worked out for the best because it was so awful that he passed away but i think the way the timing of that for the movie uh, wasn't really affected by his passing. Okay, that's fair. Now, I mean, I'm curious, like, especially on this one, because, I mean, obviously COVID was a unique circumstance, but I can imagine pre-prep and getting everything together is probably a little bit of a different experience when you've quite literally got nothing else to do than just focus on the movie. Like, you have zero other distractions. <laughs> well, I have two kids. So. Well, they, well, but were they with you? Did they get to come? I wish, you know, it, it's too bad because things here in um, Canada at that point in time were kind of starting to open up a little bit. Right. And literally after I got there, everything shut down. So if things had shut down a week later, my family would have came with me and they just spent the time there too. Oh no. And they could have just, they were, it was all virtual. But at that point in time, they were still, they were trying to do in-person schooling again. Right. Which was short lived. So unfortunately they didn't get to come, but for us, like when we landed, we had to do two weeks of quarantine. So I did my first two weeks of prep on Zoom with, you know, our, our locations manager was there a little bit of ahead of us. So he was able to go and take photos and video. Um, and so we just did a lot of prep. So I worked with my, you know, my DP. Um, we would do storyboarding over Zoom and whatnot, uh, talking with the actors. We were still casting a couple of the parts at that point, too. So it was good in the sense that I was locked in a room um, and had nothing more to do than prep. So I was able to really prep the heck out of it. Uh, and for this film, we wanted to do some stylish things with the way we shot it and some of the gags. So it was good. It gave me the time I needed. I had no reason to not do it because I wasn't pulled in all these other different directions, which often happen when you're when you're in prep on a feature. You could spend, you know, just days 
driving around in a van looking at locations and luckily we had to like trunicate that a little bit so how was the experience for you with the actors because i mean obviously mary lynn has this huge breadth of experience and is a great comedian in her own right i mean iggy and bob are icons in and of themselves i mean joel's done a bunch of stuff he's a filmmaker as well i can imagine having a cast like this i mean i don't want to say is intimidating because that's the wrong word but you're definitely sort of looking around and like almost trying to talk to them. And I can imagine having a bit more back and forth and maybe you would somebody, you know, here in Ontario for like, you know, on a, on something a bit more low budget and Canadian. You'd be surprised. It's, it's not that different. You know, I think especially when you're just working together as a professionals, you know, I think, you know, actors that have, you know, have the, the breadth of experience that a lot of these actors do, they're just, they're real pros, right? So they do a really good job of just cutting through any of that bullshit right. and just wanting you to know that they're just a human being and an actor and they're there to work with you uh, and collaborate, right? So it I don't it wasn't really that much of a difference between any of the other experiences I had had working with, you know, purely Canadian casts. That's fair. Now I mean, I'm curious because obviously this came around like when you were making it. I mean, I think the initial knives out was happening. And I mean, there there's a natural comparison that's going to happen. But to me, this is a very different movie than, say, sort of the knives out kind of stuff. How would you describe this to people? Because to me, this was a little bit more, I guess, maybe macabre, a little more dark than sort of fun and mystery, if that's the right way to describe it. Yeah, the way I described it, when I when I pitched the tone that I wanted to do with this movie to the producers, I said, I wanted to make this as if Hitchcock was still alive and just made a real balls out comedy. <laughs> I like that. Now, I mean, yeah. obviously, I'm curious, like, is it now that this is done? Because, I mean, like you said, this has been floating around for a few years and you've been working on it for a while. And I think I've asked you this question before, but I mean, I'm always curious, like, how do you as the filmmaker and the storyteller ultimately sort of be okay with letting it go? Because I mean, again, as an artist, I can imagine there's always going to be that sort of impetus and, and, and urge to sort of tweak things and re-examine things and do that kind of thing. How do you sort of be happy with what's there and then keep going? I, you know, I'm just a guy that flies by my instincts, you know, and I think that's served me fairly well. And, and that comes, and that's all the way through it's whether I'm like, looking at the script or, you know, watching a performance in the monitor on set or in the edit suite. And it's really like, I, I'm, I don't, I don't know what it is. There's just, I, I think it's, I put in those 10,000 hours of really studying and understanding, you know, character arcs and crafts. So by the time I just get into the actual making of it, I know what I want to do. And so I know when something's working and it's not you know i don't have to like futz over it for a long time and if it's working we move on you know uh i i'm not one of those people that you know for better or worse that goes in and just like frame fucks you know and right, just like because right, right, right. i think like especially in comedy there's a danger in comedy to not trust your initial instinct and especially when you're looking at something over and over and over again it just naturally becomes less funny to you, you know, yeah. uh, when you're the filmmaker, uh, it can be so easy to go, well, let's recut this scene again because it's no longer funny. It's like, well, that's because you you know where all the beats are, you know. So in comedy, it's really important to trust your instincts and not overdo it. You know, the the hardest thing about this film was that normally part of my process is I'll do a bunch of test screenings with like a full audience. Right. And at the end of the process, I get to sit down with a full audience and just walk and really listen to the film and to feel, you know, is there a lull here? Uh, does, you know, is it consistently these jokes working or not working? And then I go back and I do a further tweak just based on that. But because we were finishing this in the height of COVID, we did do one in-person test screening, but it was in like a massive theater and we could only have 20 people in it. So it was kind of useless in a way because it was not the experience that I was used to having. Um, and then they tested out a service with like an online one, which right, I, right. I couldn't tell you how helpful or not it was. So on this one in particular, I really just had to trust my gut. You know, when I did, we um, had a screening at Toronto After Dark last fall. 
which I, and I said to the audience and I kind of wasn't joking that I said, you're my first, you're my test audience. <laughs> like I've never actually watched this film with a proper full audience. So I'm going to find out today whether or not the movie sucks or not. And luckily I like it. to do that for the hometown audience for sure. Yeah. I, I just, I was just really setting the bar low. I was like, so, you know, I said, if you're going to laugh, you know, please laugh big. So I know. And if you're not, maybe just shut the hell up. <laughs> is that what comedy is the hardest though? Because I mean, obviously people from the outside looking in think comedy is easy, but there isn't any really any other genre that relies so much on sort of the rhythm of the material to, to make it effective. Yeah. It's, it's music. Comedy is music in a way, right? It's really about rhythm. It's about surprise, Yeah, you know, but it really, it just is about your instincts. You either, I think people either have comedic instincts or they don't. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you've just got to like trust them. You got to trust that your sensibility will be matched by other people. Well, Jeremy, your sensibilities were matched by other people because I watched it last night and I was laughing my ass off. It was funny as all hell. I really appreciated it. But I mean, again, just uh, congrats on the work. And, I mean, and congratulations on achieving what a Canadian filmmaker has been dying to do for 100 years. Get his movie moved from northern Ontario to, to the Cayman Islands. I, and I just had to have a global pandemic to make it happen. Exactly. All right, buddy. Thanks again, brother. Talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thanks, Dave. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs. <laughs>